Good evening. I'm David Downing, uh, the co-director of the Marion E. Waite Center at Wheaton College. Uh, I am here tonight to uh, be the moderator for a book launch by Dr. Crystal Downing, the other co-director of the Wade Center. What are the chances the two co-directors of the Wade Center would have the same last name? Uh, in any case, I'm happy tonight to introduce Crystal and her new book that just came out three weeks ago. She's been the co-director of the Wade Center since 2018. Uh, she earned her PhD at UC Santa Barbara where she received the first of three distinguished teaching awards. Uh, the next two were when she taught at UCLA and then when she taught at Messiah College in Pennsylvania. At Messiah Crystal is distinguished professor of English and film studies, where she published four books and over a hundred articles on uh, culture criticism, Dorothy Sayers and film. She also mentored and facilitated more than 30 student papers or presentations during her time at Messiah. Uh, Crystal's first book on Dorothy Sayers earned her an award from the International Dorothy L. Sayers Society and a free trip for the two of us to Cambridge to receive the award from Barbara Reynolds, uh, probably the best known Lewis scholar of that generation. So her first book was called Writing the Stages of Dorothy L. Sayers. And there you see Dorothy Sayers as the young woman impersonating her beloved choir director. And so uh, for this book that just came out three weeks ago, Crystal returned to one of her favorite subjects, Dorothy L. Sayers, and wrote a book called Subversive, the uh, Christ Culture and the Shocking Dorothy L. Sayers. So we're going to find out what is subversive about Dorothy L. Sayers. Um, and we're, it, this book has been very well received, a starred review on Publishers Weekly, and it also uh, was given the, a Publishers Weekly pick of the week when it came out three weeks ago. So we're still waiting to hear about an international award that will give us free plane tickets to England. That hasn't come through yet, but we're hoping for that. Uh, Crystal will speak for about a half hour, and then you're welcome to uh, post your questions on the Q&A button if you're on Zoom. Uh, you can also take queries if you're watching on YouTube, and we will get to those as well. And about 7.30, I will be curating the questions and uh, giving Crystal a chance to reply. Uh, also, at the end of the evening, we'll be doing a free book giveaway of three signed copies of Crystal's book, Subversive, uh, which will be chosen from those who are participating or listening in tonight. So, Crystal, I think I'll turn things over to you to talk about Subversive, Christ Culture, and the shocking Dorothy L. Sayers. Thank you, David. To begin my comments tonight, I want to talk about one of my earliest memories I was five years old and my mother took my little sister and I to the local shopping mall. And once inside Macy's, I wanted to ride the escalator. And I pleaded and pleaded and my mother said, no, your little sister is in the stroller. I can't get the stroller on the escalator. You just can't go. And I said, well, you don't have to come with me. And in her wisdom, my mother says, okay, you can go up the escalator but be sure you turn around and come right back down the adjacent escalator. So I said, yeah, sure. So I go up the escalator at age five. It was so exciting. But as soon as I got to the top, there was a glass case filled with mesmerizing objects. And I went over to it. I still remember I kneeled down in front of the case, put my hands on the glass, probably my snotty little nose as well, and just absorbed all these wonderful objects until a strange voice said, are you Crystal? And I responded by looking up at the stranger and saying, yes. And she says, well, your mother sent me to get you and I'm gonna take you back downstairs, down the ex escalator stairs. I see this story as a parable of what a life in Christ is like in terms of our desire to lift ourselves up to greater levels of wisdom and understanding, but how often in the process we get distracted by things of the world ephemeral things. And the proof of how ephemeral they are is I cannot for the life of me remember what I was looking at in that glass case in Macy's. 
whether it was toys or jewelry or silver objects. But I do remember the stranger who called my name. And for many of us, as we get distracted by things of the world, we need a stranger who calls us back, grounds us to get better perspective. And that is exactly what Dorothy Sayers did for me. To explain how she did that and what is the essence of my book, I want to talk about Dorothy Sayers' first experience of an escalator. It was 1915 in October. Sayers had recently finished her studies at Oxford University, and she had agreed to meet one of her Oxford classmates in London to go shopping. And this particular store had an escalator, which in 1915 was a pretty new phenomenon, hence why Sayers had never experienced it. And she has this great letter talking about the moment where her friend holds onto her arm as they both get onto the escalator. So in case they, if they get giddy is the word she uses, they can hold on um, and make sure the other doesn't fall. But in the process, an old lady, as Sayers calls it, starts pushing them from behind, yelling, get me off these thi this thing. I always get sick when I'm on these things. And she just pushed her way through. And one of the wonderful footnotes uh, that Barbara Reynolds includes in the collected letters is that in 1915, when stores were introducing escalators, store personnel would actually stand around with brandy that they would offer to customers in case they got faint on the escalators. Sayers describes the old lady who pushed by her as taking goat-like leaps to get off. And what's funny for us today is that many of us take goat-like leaps on escalators because they seem so annoyingly slow. And I see this as a metaphor for how people are terrified of change. Something that is incredibly subversive that ne necessitates brandy in one generation several decades later just seems de rigueur. And Sayers has numerous examples of this phenomenon among Christians. And probably the most famous one is uh, her series of radio plays that were commissioned by the BBC 12 plays about the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And Sayers took this commission extremely seriously. She spent about a year rereading the Gospels, uh, many times in the original Greek, reading Bible commentaries, histories. She wanted to be as accurate as possible in capturing the Gospel message and its context. When it got out before the first uh, airing, which was almost exactly 80 years ago this month, when it got out that Sayers did not have her characters speaking King James English, people were appalled. Christians set up a censorship campaign, writing letters to Winston Churchill, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury, demanding that these subversive radio plays be taken off the air. Sayers got threatening letters. She got harassed by the phone. People called her names. And luckily, she held on to her commitment and the radio plays went ahead and were aired. But here is the fantastic part. Because of this scandal set up by Christians, hundreds of people listened in to these broadcasts who normally would never listen to religious radio, but they wanted to get a little 
tidbit of the scandal and figure out, oh, you know, how's this subversive person challenging Christianity? And for the first time in their lives, they understood the gospel message. Sayers got thousands of letters from people, and that word thousands, she actually tells C.S. Lewis, she got thousands of letters from people who saying that her radio plays finally made the gospel clear to them, that they understood the relevance of Jesus to their lives, that they've started reading the Bible. She was wanting to put people on an escalator to take them to a new level. The trouble is, and this is a trouble that is still around today, and this is part of the reason I wrote my book, is how can Dorothy Sayers' experience of this resistance to escalators of change guide us as Christians today? As far as Sayers was concerned, this demand to not have any change to the, the language of Christianity that you got to hold on to King James English was a form of idolatry. People were putting language above the truth. She actually called it bibliolatry. Um, and as many of you know, the, the great irony of this is that around 80% of the King James version that, that Christians just wanted to hold on to, 80% of those words were translations from William Tyndale in around the 1520s. Translations for which Tyndale was strangled and burned at the stake. Why? Because everybody knows the sacred language of scripture is Latin. How dare Tyndale put us on this escalator of change? We have to hold on to tradition. Well, <clears throat> Christians today still resist escalators of cultural change, making idols of tradition. And what really bothered Sayers in, is by tradition, most people meant, well, the way my church has always talked about it for as long as I could remember. And they knew nothing about the essential traditions of Christian orthodoxy. Another irony is that Christianity itself is about change. The word conversion, the word sanctification are about changing, getting on escalators to ascend to greater Christ-likeness. So then this generates one of the key issues of my book. What is the best way, how could Sayers guide us to know which traditions to hold on to as essential components of Christianity and which changes in culture are things that we can um, climb onto while retaining our faith. I, I actually have a chapter that is called um, The Betrayal of Tradition and the Tradition of Betrayal because one of the things that Sayers taught me is that tradition comes from a Latin root that means handing over. And uh, that makes perfect sense. A tradition is something that one generation hands over to the next. The trouble is that the next generation, as they take the tradition that has been handed over and apply it to their new context, maybe on the next floor of uh, the, the house of Christianity, it inevitably gets changed. And this explains why the Latin root for tradition also is the root for treason, traitor, and traduce because handing over something is going to change it. And here is another example from Tyndale, 
um, one of the morning stars of the Reformation. Because when he translated the Bible, this very subversive act of translating the Bible from Latin into the vulgar language of English, he went back to original Greek um, words in the New Testament rather than just translate straight from the Latin. And when he did that, he discovered that some of the Latin translations led to different conclusions than the, um, the actual Greek seemed to be saying. A perfect example is the way he translated the word that we see in the New Testament as repent. But for a thousand years, people had been assuming those Bible verses that talk about repent <clears throat> were actually saying that salvation relies on doing penance. And so that shaped an actual practice of the church. And when Tyndale is saying, no, the Bible isn't telling us that we have to do acts of penance in order to get salvation. All we have to do is repent. Once again, people were horrified. Tyndale was taking them on an escalator that terrified them. So how do we know what traditions to hold on to? Um, Sayers and, would, and I both recognize that there is the opposite error of people who just celebrate progress and change for the sake of progress and change. That is as simplistic as people who resist all change. Well, the fundamental point that Sayers makes is that it, we might think of in terms of seeing an escalator. We can only trust an escalator of change if it is ground in a well-built building with a firm foundation. And for Christianity, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. But Sayers goes on from there, as she taught me, that the cornerstones of this foundation, which is Jesus Christ our Lord, were laid by church leaders at the first four <clears throat> ecumenical councils. And they are the ones who established the fundamental doctrine of Christian orthodoxy, that Jesus is both fully man and fully God. Jesus is both and. And this is this um, radical, and it's this is subversive itself, this subversive idea that an individual could both be fully divine and fully human um, simultaneously. I mean, that, that is an, a crazy, crazy idea. And we've lost the sense of how subversive it is because we just get used to it. We're so used to the language that we stop thinking about it. And basically, Sayers' model for subversive Christianity is Jesus Christ and the doctrine about Jesus Christ. So anybody who sings uh, with sincerity, may the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day, needs to consider the fact that the mind of Jesus was both and, not either or. And unfortunately, all too many people, and this is very true of our culture today, prefer either or thought, us, them, good guys, bad guys. And it is contributing to a polarization of rhetoric that is chasing young people away from the church in droves. And this is another reason I wrote this book. I start the very book talking about how um, Sayers herself was ambivalent about the Christianity that she inherited 
being born into um, the family. Her father was a rector and she never gave up on her faith, but she kind of compartmentalized it. And she would definitely understand the phenomenon today that is known as the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, that all these young people who when they fill out forms where you have to check a box for your religion are checking none. And the nuns are increasing, increasing, increasing. And part of it is they have either just become sick and tired of certain Christian rhetoric, or they're sick and tired of the antagonisms of um, either or thinking that has developed within the church. Um, so Sayers then challenges us to consider how can we change our language in order to attract people to the unchanging truth of Christianity. The truth does not change, but because it does not change, our language must. Because language gets caught up in these um, ditches of um, convention and cliche, if not become idols where people are more concerned about language than they are about knowing Jesus Christ. Now, um, we have great examples at the Wade Center of people who did the very thing that Sayers is encouraging, that we need to change the way people think about the truth of Christianity. And this is what um, C.S. Lewis did in the Narnia Chronicles and in his talking about mere Christianity. And he agrees with Sayers. Mere Christianity is the Christian orthodoxy that was established in the early centuries of the church that established that Jesus was fully God and fully man. It is both and thinking. It is not either or thinking. And um, <clears throat> As we know, Lewis has brought thousands to God because he was willing to use a new language. Tolkien has used a new language to talk about sacrificial love. And of course, Sayers used a new language in Man Born to be King and brought thousands to the faith because of it. I have a whole chapter then about the power of creativity to think of new language that can draw people to Christ rather than push them away. And most of us do not have the talent of creating fiction that, that um, is manifest by Sayers, Tolkien, and Lewis, as well as other authors in the Wade Connect collection, excuse me, but we all have the ability to use language. How can we creatively come up with a language that shocks people into thinking about the truth of Christianity in a new way? And I just give example after example after example of how Dorothy Sayers did it. Just one simple one with which I start the book is that she would say, you know, can people, people complain about the murder of God? Well, Christianity is about the murder of God. And people were shocked. What do you mean? But if you really believe in the incarnation, if you believe in um, the dogma established in the early centuries of the church, you do believe that God was murdered on the cross. But people aren't used to that language. So that language shocks them into seeing in a new way. And so Sayers would want us to use our creativity. She actually believed that creativity fulfills the Imago Dei. In other words, all of us are created in the image of God. 
And when you look at the verse that tells us about the image of God, Genesis 127, it is in a chapter in the opening of Genesis in which the God in whose image we were created, that God is a creator. It, that God as presented in Genesis one is not a lawgiver or a judge or even a redeemer, but God is creator and we were made in God's image. We need to creatively think of ways that might encourage people to get onto escalators with us that are attached to a firm foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That gives you just a tidbit of what I talk about in my book. There's plenty more we could talk about. So I want to make sure that your questions get answered. So David, why don't you lead us in um, or present some questions that have come in? Thank you, Crystal. You did a, a very good job explaining some of her key ideas. I'm sure there'll be questions about some of her other books and other ideas. Uh, we have a question here from Amy Nemechek, who says, I've been reading Man, Word to be King for the first time as an Advent spiritual practice, and I'm enthralled. Do you know whether the original BBC recordings are available in a digital format? Has anyone ever recorded the plays for a modern audience? If not, might it, that be a future project for the Wade Center to undertake? Yes, that would be so wonderful. We do have some early recordings at the Wade Center, but they can only be listened um, on our facility. So we do not have permission to make those recordings from the BBC available online for people, but we would just love, and, and we've actually talked about this, to someday make our own recordings because you're exactly right. It is a, an amazing collection of um, retellings in new language of the ancient truth of um, the gospel story. It is fantastic and very subversive. Sayers does some amazing things in Man Born to be King. But, and I have to tell me, and maybe this is why I'm so fascinated with the whole escalator image. The first time I read Man Born to be King, my brain was so thinking along the grooves of um, assumptions that, that I had had my whole life that I, I didn't even notice the, the shocking things that Sayers was communicating, but things that are all consonant within um, Orthodox Christianity. So I'm glad you like it. Yeah, I think we are moving ahead. We're hoping to do eventually at the Wade Center an annotated man board to be king. So we have side notes to help people understand some of the illusions they may not catch. And uh, eventually we are hoping to sponsor our own uh, audio retelling of man board to be king. So stay tuned for that development. Thanks, Crystal. Here's a question from Steve Beebe. How should we change our language and modify the way we communicate about Christianity, drawing upon Sayers' ideas for sharing the good news? What are the practical language and communication lessons we can learn from Sayers? How appropriate for a communication theorist to ask that. <clears throat> the example I gave of even saying something like the murder of God um, just to get out of cliched thinking. And for many of us, it is a matter of coming up creatively with metaphors that might make sense to others. Like even the way I started with my metaphor of my first experience of an escalator and seeing that as a parable for what it means to be um, journeying towards greater levels of truth and understanding. The thing is, um, 
people need to create metaphors out of their own experience. And I make some suggestions in the book how that might be done. Um, and so I suggest you read those. Here, here's just one uh, easy one that I have included in my other work. I actually learned it from David, my husband. He went to the University of um, Colorado at Boulder for a year when he was actually grappling with his faith, um, having trouble with kind of the um, old um, idolatry of language that he was encountering. And when he first got to Boulder, there was a grassy um, spot that had a big sign in black and white that said, keep off the grass. And the main thing you noticed is that there were these pathways just cutting into, so you just saw the dirt underneath. Everybody was ignoring the signs. And finally, some smart person realized we've got to keep the same truth that we want to communicate, but use language that makes sense to people on this campus in the 1970s. And so one day a new sign went up that said, um, give Mother Earth a chance. Um, stay off the grass or stay on the sidewalks. And David reports that by the end of the semester, all the grass had grown back. Same truth, but a language that appeals to the context of the person you, with whom you're communicating. So what that means then, you have to care about the people you communicate with because you have to understand what their context is, what um, makes meaning in their lives and relate it to Christianity. Mm -hmm. As you said, Crystal, that's a great question from a communication scholar. Uh, Steve Beebe once gave us the example. Uh, a Japanese person was saying, how do I introduce the Narnia Chronicles to a, a room full of Japanese students who are not Christian? And my first thought was often the, the lead message in evangelizing was Christ died for your sins. But Steve suggested the first question to this class might be, do you have a longing for home? Is there a yearning there, an unfulfilled yearning for home? And I thought that was such a more excellent way to approach that situation than some of the uh, rhetoric that we're used to from our, our younger days. Uh, here's a question from Heidi Trudy. Your comments about Sayers' ambivalence uh, to Christianity inherit as, as inherited helped me potentially make sense of some of her personal decisions. I'm thinking that her wrestling with doctrine requiring dynamic response and expression fueled her challenge to the church. Yes. That's exactly the way I start my book. Uh, she had um, quite a bit of problem with um, certain expectations and a whole nother thread of my book that I just didn't have time to get to this evening that relates to escalators because escalators made their first appearances in department stores is uh, that all religions operate according to the same principles as a department store. It, it is based on a principle of exchange. I give you this money, I get a product in exchange. And that's the way most religions function. Um, I give you this ritual, I give you this practice, I give you this sacrament, I give you this language, and I get salvation in exchange. And this um, was something that Sayers finally recognized was the problem with the way she was thinking about Christianity as she was growing up. When she was confirmed, and she was confirmed in um, Salisbury Cathedral, you know, this gorgeous place, and she wrote home, oh, it was so lovely. But la decades later, she described the whole ceremony to someone else as something she was forced to do, um, and it turned her off to religion at an early age, she was a, um, an adolescent. So she understands how um, 
uh, warping of Christianity, we buy into that warping. And so a big part of my book is the problem how Christians today perpetuate this idea that um, buying into religion is like buying products at a store and ignoring the escalator as I did when I saw the little products up on the second, second floor um, in my first experience. So the distinctive element of Christianity that makes it different from all other religions and I show how Sayers because when she finally recognized this, she provides us a, with a fantastic argument to show how simplistic it is to say that all religions lead to the same God. All religions are the same, except for Christianity, all religions are the same insofar as they operate by this, this monetary exchangist principle. And she assimilated an exchangist principle in her Christianity and it turned her off. And, it, and um, she, in her adult life, and she was middle-aged where she was finally able to fully assimilate the idea that salvation is a gift, not because of exchange, lest any um, one should boast. And this goes back to, and would answer Steve Beebe's earlier question about how do we change our language? This is something that I do because I've discovered if you approach people and say, oh, you must be born again, or have you asked Jesus into your heart? Even though I believe the truth of those, that language, they've heard it so much or they've had bad experiences with it, it pushes them away. So I get them talking about, well, what do you notice is true of most religions and get them talking about this problem of the quid pro quo of religion, tit for tat. You gotta do this if you want heaven. You gotta believe this if you don't um, wanna go to hell. And um, what we need to communicate is, and we can use the language that Christianity does not operate by shopping principles by an economy of exchange. Christianity is a gift. And Crystal coined a term for people who go from church to church trying to find the right exchange or their emotional needs are being met or even they're being entertained. She coined the word, we're shopping. Mm -hmm. Did you use that in the book? I forgot if that made it. Yeah, possible. we're shopping. Uh, yeah. We're shopping, that was a good. Here's yeah. a question from Alan Snyder. Uh, Sayers minded the maker helped me engage more productively with the idea of being a creator. Does your new book deal with Mind of the Maker and what does Sayers offer there? Yes, I have a whole chapter called The Subversive Mind of the Maker. And this is the principle that I was referring to about how maybe we can't create fiction the way Tolkien and Lewis can, but we can create new language. Um, we can talk about and start um, when we're witnessing to people say, you know, what really bothers me about religion is we're shopping. Um, and they go, what do you mean we're shopping? And explain, as I just did, how isn't it, it's so um, annoying how all religions, you just have to go through um, or give something with the expectation of something com coming back in exchange. And people go, yeah, yeah. And I go, but isn't it interesting that Christianity doesn't do that? And they go, well, what do you mean? Because the trouble is most people, including Sayers in her youth, that's the way they have been taught Christianity operates. And the irony is that there are all these Christians who would be, who are just horrified at the idea that all religions lead to the same God. And yet they act as though Christianity is just like any other religion because they participate in word shopping as I, as I call it. Um, here's a good example. In 2018, Christianity Today reported that a Lifeway survey, research survey, um, queried people who self-identify as evangelicals. And 41% said that their church teaches that 
um, if you give money to the church, God will bless you in exchange. It's just quid pro quo. Uh, we have questions piling up here, so I'll, I'll give you some okay. more questions. Uh, Greg Anderson asks, was her detective fiction a distraction or vital to her project? Oh, well, I'm actually in uh, writing another book on Sayers right now, and I'm talking about um, her detective fiction. She actually started it because she was desperate for money. She wanted to make money writing um, silent movie scenarios. Nobody knows this. That's why I'm writing a book, and I have access to unpublished documents to help support that. Um, so she actually wrote her parents, she says, well, there's good money in detective fiction. And so I, I just need an income. I'll, I'll just go ahead and do that. And um, she had trouble getting her first book published, but most of us have trouble getting our first book published. Uh, but the, her character of Lord Peter Whimsey uh, attracted people so much that she turned into a best-selling author, even though she... Um, was getting really annoyed with Lord Peter Whimsey. By her fourth novel, she just wanted to get rid of him and um, marry him off because um, love interests don't often work in detective novels. And she actually says that. I was going to marry Lord Peter off to get rid of him. So she invented this other character. Now, and here, this goes back to um, Alan's <clears throat> question about the mind of the maker and how creativity is the Imago Dei, that Sayers was already starting to grapple with the importance of integrity of work. And she had created a woman to marry off to Lord Peter, but then she had created such an interesting woman that she said, oh my goodness, I don't wanna straddle this wonderfully intelligent woman with the insufferably breezy Lord Peter Whimsey. So she said, I have to change Lord Peter Whimsey to make him worthy of Harriet Vane. So she was really starting to think about the responsibility of creativity. And um, she ended up writing one of the most subver subversive detective novels ever. Um, her uh, second to last detective novel, Gaudy Night, where there is no murdered body in it. Detective novels were always about a murder that has to be solved. And so she, she was subversive even before she um, started integrating her Christianity much um, more thoroughly into her writing process. Okay, great. And so the mystery in Gaudy Night is who ate all the ice cream and put the carton back in the refrigerator? Is that the mystery? <laughs> no, that can't be right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's another question from a novice attendee. I read a little, I read a little of Sayer's biography. It seems to me that some of her personal story is informed by her journey of Christian sexuality in a variety of ways. Do you think that her personal experience in this area contributed to her ability to reach different people through her language? Well, definitely. Um, <clears throat> Sayers, one of the things that convinced Sayers that Christianity was true is that she was convinced that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And she definitely felt that in her own life. Uh, so the trouble is though, Again, this problem with war shopping, where people just treat sin as something you do, um, you go through a rite and you get purified in exchange. So um, I knew someone in college who was starting to become very attracted to Roman Catholicism because he said, oh, it's just so great. I could just sin all I want during the week and I just go to confession and Eucharist on the weekend and I'm fine. And you know, most Roman Catholics would be appalled at that idea, but that's what people do. They reduce Christianity to this economy of exchange. Now I forgot what the original question was. Uh, it had to do with, um... <laughs> Uh, sexuality in reading oh. the biography. Yeah, I, I don't, I, 
Sayers had um, a baby out of wedlock and uh, I hesitate to talk about it because then it becomes so, um, it looms so large in people's imaginations. Um, I think that's part of the reason Sayers is not as well known. There's a gender issue because of course, there's real questionable stuff that C.S. Lewis was into. He was into SM, sadomasochism, as we know from his letters, I mean, as a youth. Um, so part of the problem even there is because the reason Sayers got pregnant is that she was told a good Christian does not use birth control. And so that itself then, um, because she didn't use birth control and, and she got pregnant in a rebound uh, relationship. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but I don't want to reduce Sayers to that. And I think too many people have, but if it made her aware later in life that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and that is something that um, she would have us all recognize. She has this great line. Again, she thought this either or mindset uh, that is continuing to polarize Christianity. And she um, has a line in one of her plays where she says, we are all both Cain and Abel. We are all both victimizers and victims. And she would say, until we can recognize the both and in ourselves, we won't fully grasp the incredible grace of the gift that God has given us through Christ. Okay. Uh, more questions. Walter Hansen asked, to what extent does Dorothy Sayers see the development of new subversive language as a product of belonging and learning in a community of believers or as the project of an individual believer? Oh, she definitely believed in community. We have a, um, our colleague, Christine Cologne had produced a book that was part of the Hansen lecture series. Um, and I, uh, I talk about this as well in my book, Sayers once compared the church to a theater troupe. She says, a theater has all the stigmata of what a church should be like, because to bring a play to completion, you need people with many different gifts. And Sayers discovered through her work in theater and it was her work in theater that really brought her um, back to infuse her whole life with Christianity. But um, a, an actor recognizes if you don't have a good sound technician, no matter who, how good your acting is, the play is not going to succeed. And you need good lighting technicians. And she felt like people in theater understood what we're told in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, which are the longest extended metaphors that Paul ever gives us of the, the multiple gifts of the body of Christ, that not all our hands, not all our um, ears, etc., cetera, that uh, we need each other. And Sayers felt like the church needs to be more like theater, where we recognize we are all working together, but we have different um, skills, but they're all creative. So she would avoid this idea of autonomous, it's just uh, you and me, Jesus type Christianity. That was, that's a very good question. That's a good question. Uh, I'm going to take a short break here to talk about our free signed copies, and then we'll take a few more questions. Um, I just want you to know that we are giving away three signed copies, and better than being signed copies, they're signed by Crystal, the author. <laughs> so that makes them even more valuable. Uh, and so if you would like to uh, be considered for a free signed copy, please write to uh, wade at wheaton.edu and just let us know you're interested. We will pick out three of those who write in at random. And at the end of this program, I will announce who those three winners are. 
Now, if you are not one of the three winners, you're always welcome to uh, buy a copy of a signed copy of Subversive from the Wade Center. So once again, you would write to the Wade at Wheaton, or you can write or you can phone 630-752-5908 during work hours, uh, Monday to Friday, 9 to 1 uh, Central Standard Time. And uh, that would be another opportunity to get your own signed copy. Uh, so while you're emailing a few things, I'll give some more questions to Crystal. Let me just add something. So people, when they hear oh, your random selection, um, they actually had me select certain numbers in advance. So we have advanced numbers. So it's not like we're just picking out names of, of um, people we like or something. It's we have selected numbers in advance. Okay. So okay. our advice is try to submit as randomly as possible. <laughs> you know, so that's our advice for winning the book. Uh, Douglas Vanderplog says, Christians have a jargon they can't seem to get away from. For example, Crystal seems not able to say Jesus Christ without adding our Lord. Do you see that as part of the problem? Oh, well, I often say Jesus Christ without saying our Lord. Um, so that's funny that you would say that. Uh, it's because I was constantly alluding back to this um, famous hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, and that provides an interesting example. So I was just alluding to my earlier reference by saying that. So that was an illusion, not a rut that I was in. Um, music provides a perfect example of the need to be, um, to change. And in 1957, when Dorothy Sayers died, there was a group of musicians who got together who changed music considerably. They called themselves the Beatles. And um, in the decade to follow, it started changing church music even. Uh, people were, uh, and many people were horrified. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when people were outraged that electric guitars and drums were being used in church, the, the instruments that are used by the Beatles and, and other rock groups. And they protested the way people protested King James English for Sayers radio plays. Um, and one of the examples I give in my book is a woman who wrote her pastor just complaining about the fact that the recent music in church is the melody is unidentifiable, the, the lyrics are so simplistic. Why can't we get to back to the um, old famous hymns? And then I reveal the, the fact that this letter was written in 1890 about what a friend we have in Jesus. So once again, things that are terrifying, like escalators at their start, become uh, de rigueur later on. And this resistance we have to um, new forms of expression. Again, the, church, the, the truth does not change, but our language needs to, if, we want to bring the truth of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to right. others. Uh, and I would recommend to Doug that he read Crystal's other book called Changing Signs of Truth. That entire book is about maintaining the essentials, but uh, uh, updating your rhetoric. I noticed that in the 30s, people were proud to be called fundamentalists because they believed in the fundamentals of the faith. They weren't wandering into modernism. But then uh, later on, you didn't want to be a fundamentalist. That sounded... Uh, too backward or too anti-intellectual, so you were an evangelical. And now the word evangelical is becoming problematic. And I hear people saying, well, I'm a Christ follower. They don't even want to say I'm a Christian. So I think that is really a key question, Doug, is how do we keep our language fresh to meet the contemporary culture? I'm teaching a course right now <clears throat> on uh, our weight authors. And Charles Williams, he didn't even like to say the word God. He would say under the mercy or uh, under the omnipotence, or he would talk about the limit, limitless light or the first fair. And he was very aware how even a, a simple word like God can cease to be effective. So he was constantly seeking syn synonyms. 
excuse me, this is your book launch, Crystal, isn't it? But I'm helping you launch your other book, Changing Signs of Truth, really hits that question straight on, Douglas. Um, here's a question from Daniel Whittier. We need to wrap up in a few minutes here. Uh, Daniel says, in your book, do you, you, do you write about Dorothy Sayers addressing, excuse me, <coughs> uh, Daniel Whittier, in your book, you write about Dorothy Sayers addressing the belief of our relationship Um, in your book, do you write about Dorothy Sayers addressing the belief in our relationship with Jesus Christ as being part of a quid pro quo relationship? I'm saved because I believe in Jesus. It, it sounds like a deal. It sounds like an exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's what um, one of the ways we might think that we need to be careful about our language, because as soon as we say um, you get salvation in exchange for belief, you're turning Christianity, you're making Christianity like all other religions. Now, what I do go on to say, however, is that in order to accept a gift, you have to believe it's been offered to you. So belief is essential because if you don't believe a gift um, has been offered to you, you, don't, you won't notice it or else you think you're being manipulative you're being manipulated. So yeah, belief is essential in order to accept the gift of salvation provided by the death and, death and resurrection of Christ. But we have to get away from this idea that, oop, I better spend this coin of belief if, and if I want something in exchange for it. So um, you see, there's quite a difference between um, those two attitudes about belief. Um, in terms of another example from Sayers, tell us about her answer when people say, when were you saved? No. Oh. response to that yeah. question. Yeah. Um, this also concerned her because um, so many people, they thought, oh yes, I've done the right thing. Just like, oh, I went to the store and got this great deal on a new sweater. Oh, I had this wonderful conversion experience. And that concerned Sayers because it's all about what I did. Whereas Sayers believed, and this is what Orthodox Christianity teaches, that it's Jesus Christ who saves us. We don't save ourselves because we spent the right coin of practice or ritual or language or belief. Um, so she reputedly answered people when they asked, um, when were you saved? She said, when Christ rose from the dead. She wanted to emphasize the work is Christ's. Salvation doesn't depend on me. All I do is accept a gift that has been offered me. Okay, that sounds to me like uh, good closing words for this discussion. A lot of good questions and good comments. Uh, let me go and... Uh, oh, I was gonna look and see if I had the... the uh, Winners of the signed copies available, but they're not there yet. So, Crystal, you're still there, are you not? Uh, do people knew, kn know they were supposed to write in to... Uh, right. Uh, Wade you would like Wheaton. To find, yes. Uh, Wade at Wheaton.edu, W-A-D-E, and then at, A with a circle around it, Wheaton, W-H-E-A-T-O-N.edu. I'll just interject uh, right now that the winners are in the chat. And I'm happy to announce them if you're not seeing them, David. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. My, it was covered by my Q&A box. Okay. I'm sorry. I had the Q&A box open and I didn't see the chat box underneath it. Um, so as we already have a sign that says, uh, order your, your copy, a 10% discount from, by emailing the wait at Wheaton. So that's posted in the chat box. Our winners tonight are... Catherine Shilka, Amy Nimichek, and Douglas Vanderplog. So you three will be receiving uh, free copies, free signed copies uh, for your participation tonight. 
uh, I assume you'll be asked to uh, give us your address, your mailing address. Also, if you'd like to be uh, become aware of emails about future events, this spring we have two more Hanson lectures about Tolkien, Lewis, and uh, earthkeeping or good stewardship. Two more lectures this spring. Uh, we'll have some more book launches. I believe there will be uh, balloon animals and a dancing bear sometime this spring. So you do <laughs> want to be on our mailing list to see what, what events are, are coming up. Uh, so with that, let me wrap this up and say thank you very much for tuning in, for, for listening, and we will look forward to <coughs> being with some of you again. Crystal, closing words. <clears throat> May the mind of Christ our Savior live with us from day to day. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs>